All right, we are we are now live. Uh, so uh, I, I always wait a little bit here. It's my favorite thing to watch the participant number down at the bottom of the screen because it just turns over and over and over. Um, and you can give people time to log on. Um, welcome everyone. I'm glad you're back with us um, for the Staying Connected webinar this week. We uh, have shifted gears this week to talk to our Canadian friends. Um, I feel like I should say A, but uh, <laughs> I bet you get that all the time. Uh, but uh, you know, to find out how they're doing, um, what's going on with their companies. Um, I think we now saw that the border's not going to open now until the end of February. Um, so we hope that 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 one sticks and we don't push it any further. Uh, but really looking forward to our conversation today. As everyone's logging in, like you always do, um, put something in the chat and let us know where you're coming in from or tell us hello and write on cue, Amy from Drury. She's always the first, right? <laughs> uh, um, and Lori, thank you. I'm glad to see everyone coming in. Um, and um, before I forget, Tour Operator Land um, is always our sponsor. And if you haven't worked with Betsy Cooper, you should totally do so. Um, it's an amazing tool and she will put her information in the chat so you can contact her. Um, but as we're getting going, because I know that everyone's going to have a lot of questions, um, I want everyone to meet Nadine and Sash. And while I could introduce them, they're going to introduce themselves and their companies much better than I can. Um, so ladies first, Nadine, tell us a little bit about your company, what your focuses are, um, and what you do. Great. Thank you so much, Sherry, uh, for having me and to Sash for letting me go first here. Uh, so Kensington Tours is headquartered out of Toronto, Ontario. Uh, we do have offices across the United States. We are a premium and luxury operator who service both uh, direct clients as well as uh, our agent community. Uh, we have over 600 itineraries uh, that are offered across the globe and really act as an inspiration to our clients uh, for both our, again, our direct and agent community. And they deliver across four main pillars to give you a brief overview of, of Kensington. We deliver on a privately guided experience led by local guides. We deliver personalized journeys, which means we are 100% customizable. So when a destination expert is connected with the client, any customer requests, we, we service to the Kensington standard. Uh, we offer 24 seven and destination support on each trip, uh, as well as before and after the trip. And then of course our destination expertise, as mentioned, our destination experts have been available throughout 2020 to answer the calls, uh, offer support to our clients and agents. Um, we also fall underneath the larger brand of Travel Edge, who services the luxury clients in both leisure and business. And with Kensington Tours, I lead the product and procurement initiatives. Awesome. Thank you, thank you, thank you for taking the time to be with us. Um, and Sash, you're up. Tell us, tell us about what's going on with you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you, Sherry. And uh, nice to meet you, Nadine. Um, so short trips is sort of, uh, I would like to say, very different from um, most um, uh, tour operators. We um, we mainly are a bus tour company operating out of Toronto. We're based in Toronto as well. Um, and the difference is that our market is primarily domestic, has been really from day one. Um, since our goal always was to offer shorter trips, uh, we didn't really get the international business. And, you know, and I have to confess that over the years, we would look at this growth in international traffic coming into Canada, a market that we were basically missing out on since we had none of it. And then when COVID hit and we start listening to where the market is going, now the trend word was go local. And uh, that's a market that we've been serving for, for many years. So our uh, focus is uh, tours based uh, out of Toronto. We're just a single location um, and uh, primarily going to the US and Canada. We did start adding in some international tours, um, I would say a few years ago. Um, if you see the picture behind me, Iceland was one of our regulars. That's a Northern Lights picture. Um, and we, I were um, admiring that when you were logging in. Really. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that, I mean, it's such a fabulous tour. Uh, so we're hoping, of course, to, uh, to resume those. Actually, that was an interesting challenge, speaking as a, as a travel provider because we had a tour scheduled to leave on March the 16th this year, which was for us the beginning of spring break for schools. And that's of course when 
the lockdown started and we ended up having basically a sold out busload of, uh, of people getting stranded um, and we weren't able to fly out because of the um, of the announcement that the prime minister made that said to all Canadians don't travel. Uh, so that was an interesting uh, challenge for us as I'm sure many of the people on this call uh, experienced. But anyway, so we do some international um, tours. Um, mainly so far they've been to Europe, although we've done some to Costa Rica and of course um, Iceland. But by and large, all of our tours are either the US and Canada and our rule of thumb typically has been if we can drive there or we can fly there in North America, we'll plan a tour there. So well, thank I you for the that. chance to do the I introduction. Love that. It, it served you well. Uh, so, you. so tell me, um, you know, ever I think one of the number one questions that we get um, from everyone on the call, so I'm just going to ask it for them, is, is, you know, what are you hearing from your clients right now? Obviously, we know what happened in 2020. We know we, know we rescheduled things. We know we rebooked where we could. Um, are, are your clients, you know, is there consumer sentiment up? Are they looking to book now or are they still in that inspirational, hey, this is where I want to go when I can? Oh, you, take that, uh, oh. you can go first for this one, Sash. I'll catch up. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Sash. <laughs> okay, well, um, uh, we've basically been shut down um, like everyone else since March mm -hmm. of last year. We did have a little window to gauge um, customer sentiment uh, in September, um, as the COVID rates dropped in the summer, uh, summer last year, uh, we were able to get some bus tours going. Um, I think our first tour restarted on August the 29th, and we managed to go five weeks until October the 6th when the Premier of Ontario made another announcement that said we're locking down again. But during those five weeks, we managed to get 12 tours out. Um, all sold out, but I should clarify, sold out to us used to mean 55 uh, passengers, and now it meant 24 because we were doing social distancing on the bus. Uh, so basically, each passenger had their own window seat, no one next to them. Um, and then we implemented a whole bunch of other policies to try to minimize the exposure and so on. But the point I was going to make was that from gauging customer sentiment, we didn't have to rely on anecdotal evidence or people sending us emails and words of encouragement, we actually saw it in action that literally we had trips that we'd never done before, short day trips, except for one overnighter, which was our experiment to determine if people were comfortable staying in hotels. Uh, all the tours sold out and they sold out within hours. I mean, we would put the trip up at 7 a.m. in the morning when the announcement would go out and by 11 a.m. it was sold out, 24 people. We'd add a second date for the exact same trip, sold out by four o'clock in the afternoon at a third date. So we ended up, um, as I said, doing 12 tours, which was a surprise. We hadn't expected that response. And the feeling from at least our passengers, who all tend to be local Southern Ontario passengers, was, thank God you're up and running. I couldn't wait. We had people who came on six out of the 12 tours. In fact, one lady did all 12. Uh, she was just booking them consecutively. And you would say, didn't you just do this last week? She said, yeah, but I have to get out. <laughs> so that's, that's our experience with sentiment, which means that I'm very optimistic that as soon as we start adding some tours to our schedule and announcing them, that the throngs shall follow. I love that. I, I, everyone's just like us, right? I mean, the three of us were just talking about we can't wait until we can travel again. And where are we going to go next? Um, so Nadine, what about Kensington? Have you heard, have you, I mean, were you experiencing the same thing? A little bit, a little bit different, again, because Kensington's core model is around private guided. So while we have reduced significantly the number of clients we have in destination globally, uh, we still have had clients traveling throughout the pandemic. So there, there are definitely uh, consumer sentiment out there. You know, our, our client pool is a bit divided in that there's some clients who are very eager and ready to go in destination and adhere to any new uh, pivots uh, that the industry uh, rules, regulations have uh, instated. And then there's also the pool of clients who are a bit more hesitant, want a little, little bit more of a level of consistency on air, airports, airplanes, um, destination specifics, and just an overall level of consistency around border opening and border closings. So we are, as of late, hearing a lot of, when can I travel? Um, and if they're not saying, when can I travel? It's, you know, we, we've 
had a lot of moves uh, versus cancels in, within our organization. And, and some of them, especially in Europe, were on their second or third move. Um, and in that case, some of them have been converting from international destinations to domestically. Um, so if they can't travel to a certain destination, they're then saying, well, if I can't go to Italy, where can I go? Um, so we're seeing some, some conversion there to Alaska or the national parks. Um, some clients are in the daydreaming phase, which I think we're all a little bit in, uh, whether we're cognizant of it or not. Uh, so our sales team, our destination experts are engaging with clients. Uh, we have you know, a whole pool of warm leads and they're really ready to come to fruition and ready for, for the clients to travel when borders do open and that level of consistency is instated. That's great. So one thing that we heard, and, and Sash mentioned this, and, and Nadine, you did as well. Um, when you were explaining what your company did, Sash, you know, and, and everything that was going on and you were looking at international, you were like, oh, well, everyone's going local. Um, so that's what we do. So did you find yourself knowing that, hey, I'm gonna to try to do some domestic tours or where I have offices, you know, that we can get people going. Did you find yourself reaching out regionally, you know, to the community to, you know, how did you build up that product locally that maybe, you know, the, wasn't top of mind of doing other things? Oh, uh, yeah, that's, that's an interesting question because some of the tours that we did end up experimenting with in September were actually very new to us. And, um, you know, what, what influenced us was we were trying to keep the tour simple. We just didn't know, didn't know enough about COVID, didn't know how complex we should, we should make the tours. So we had a, a, just a simple tour and literally it was a day trip to take you apple picking, essentially all it was with a guided hike through um, one of our provincial parks. That was the entire tour. Normally, we try to build in additional things. We try to build in a lunch. We try to build in some something else. But that was it. No lunch included. We stopped at one of the venues, which accommodates buses on our way there. And uh, people were on their own. Again, um, because of the issue around COVID and dining and social distancing and trying to organize, um, organize, organize lunches or dinners. Um, but anyway, the, the, the response was, love the simple tour. I want to go somewhere, anywhere. And I don't want to go away for a long period of time. And I don't want to do an overnight. <laughs> um, so we let that guide our, our, our tour planning, which meant in answer to your question, Sherry, yes, we did have to reach out to venues we might not have spoken to before. Uh, fortunately, we, you know, we're members of the Ontario Motor Coach Association. We know hundreds of venues that we've not had an opportunity to use in the past. So it was a simple matter of going into our database and going, okay, what can we do? And uh, getting one of our tour planners to put these somewhat easier ones together. Um, by the way, I don't know if um, you, this question is gonna come up later, you're gonna ask us about this, but I do wanna cover the topic of how we ran into some issues with incorporating dining as part of our tours, but I'll leave it It was that. gonna come up later, but you go, go ahead. Well, the the um, you know one of the one of the things that I think we're all going to have to do for the future as travel professionals is take more responsibility now uh, uh, for our passengers. Now Nadine already offers custom tours, so they already do this. We traditionally don't. You know, we're a bus tour company. We put together a tour, and so when we communicate to a, a supplier. In this case, specifically, I'm talking about dining establishments, be they banquet halls or restaurants. We would typically in the past have said, OK, we've got two buses coming in, need to feed 110 people, plus our two drivers and two tour guides. Let's discuss the menu. And then we discuss the menu. We'd make sure there was an adequate selection. And we went a little bit further and we would ask about room layout so we could figure out whether there was bottlenecking, for example, at the buffet tables. Sure. Now, the buffets are gone. But the thing that we ran into was on one of the trips that we did in September, we had 26 people, 24 plus our guide and driver. And we went to all this trouble to do screening. We did 
temperature checks. We made them use sanitizer. They had to wear face masks on the bus at all times. There had to be the seating. We reorganized our seating and now we seat people by name starting from the back of the bus so they don't have to pass each other in the aisles. All those kinds of things. So we go to all this trouble. We go to the restaurant that we've negotiated with and I get a photo from my bus driver and it shows all 26 people sitting at one table with no spacing between them. And I'm like, what happened to the bubbles? So that's when we realized that the restaurant itself was not following protocol that we'd been enforcing. And so now when we just um, talk to the hotels and we talk to the restaurants, the type of conversation is very different. Uh, one of the things that we started to do was sending the restaurants a list of our dining bubbles which is something we've not done in the past, which meant that we had 26 people and we would say, look, we need 18 single tables because these people are traveling on their own. They need their own table of two, separation from the adjoining table. And that created challenges because the restaurants are wasting a lot of tables now, but that's the reality of it yeah. until things change. Anyway, I wanted to cover that. I'm, well, I'm glad you did. I'm sure that I, that would have been a question. Um, and. And Nadine, you know, working with a community, one thing we've heard over and over is the consistent need is communication, open communication with your clients, with, with and, and Sash, that was a great example of that, you know, in, in talking about working with restaurants and, and dining um, options in the age that we're living in now. Um, when you were, when you were looking and maybe moving people from international back to domestic, um, did you have the tours there or did you have to create some things you know what uh how did you handle that and there is a question specifically for you nadine on um, destination experts and they would like you to elaborate a little bit more on that how are they locals um how do you train them you know kind of kind of how that program works absolutely so let me first uh start with the, the product development focus and then we'll, we'll get to the destination yeah. experts um so sash hit it on the head with simplicity uh, removing the complexity and really looking at product in a different perspective over the last 12 months, really. Uh, when we first started uh, seeing the implications of COVID, we looked at our product portfolio of 600 itineraries and said, how can we make this better and more relevant um, to the environment that travelers will react to now? So we did launch a few different collections, one being our retreat collection, which was focused on less moving around. So if you think of Europe or Asia, Australia Pacific, even Latin America, where many itineraries are very complex and you're moving around hotel to hotel to jam pack as much as you can in there to see in the destination, we took that back a step and we said, okay, how can we make this a little bit more simple uh, in a way that our clients are still enjoying the destination, they're still enjoying privately guided experiences, they're still enjoying unique accommodations that are reflecting the local personality of that culture and, and destination. So we looked at uh, short haul destinations where clients wouldn't have to spend a lot of time on, on an aircraft. Uh, we looked at destinations that were a little bit more removed from the cities. Uh, that reflected, again, that local personality, um, but we're also in a specific location where we could do private guided touring a few days to five days from that specific location. We also looked at accommodation that had direct entry uh, versus a client having to go through public areas and elevator or lobby to get to their, their uh, room. So we, we have looked at things a little bit differently there for, and that was our retreat collection. Mm -hmm. And uh, over the fall, we also launched our resorts collection. And that's uh, more focused on sun and sand, but again, staying in a single mm -hmm. proper property and having the value add of specific amenities that are specific to Kensington, as well as privately guided experiences from that destination. Uh, so the resort collection primarily focuses on the Caribbean, Mexico, mm -hmm. Maldives, um, and, and some of our sun and sand destinations. When we look to our um, overall product portfolio, we are always uh, looking at ways that we can react to the current environment and the current demand. So we, um, we're very quick to pivot at Kensington. I always joke that we're first an IT company and then we're a tour operator with our CEO being uh, heavily experienced in IT. 
prior to founding uh, Kensington Tours. So we're very quick to pivot and very quick to merchandise on our, on our website uh, into both the repeat, direct, and, and Asian communities. To answer uh, the kind question about destination experts, so we have a, a very full team right now of destination experts available on, again, to offer support to clients and agents. Uh, destination experts are located primarily in the Toronto office, but some of that has changed over the last uh, 10 months or so as a result of COVID and you know, some of our experts returning home, wanting to spend a little bit more time with family um, and or experiencing traveling right now in destinations. So we source and, and look at our destination expert team very specifically around, have they lived in the destination they're selling? Have they you know, had extensive sales experience in um, the Maldives or Greece or Italy um, or Peru? And you know, we, we take that lens, they are not an, um, they do not sell all destinations, they're very specific on the destinations that they do sell. I hope that answers that question. Absolutely. Um, and and you, you both said, you know, one thing that I want to circle back to um, when you're sourcing product, you said you could pivot on a dime, uh, you know, and, and based on what's going on in, in the world, both of you, you know, took a step back and simplified and, and created some new opportunities um, based on, on the market. Is that something that you think will continue? through 2021? Do you, I mean, do you see that continuing through the end of this year? I, I can jump in here. Uh, pivoting is part of our core value as an organization. So I, I very much think it will continue. Uh, each week we meet as an executive team and with our leadership team to evaluate the consumer sentiment, what we're hearing from clients because uh, our destination experts are again, engaging with them weekly um, whether they want to move, cancel, or switch destinations, or, or simply receive an update on their uh, selected destinations. So we meet weekly to pivot uh, and to review our merchandising strategy and, and what makes the most sense going forward. Uh, as we all know, every day is a new day, and it seems like new news is coming at us and new regulations. So uh, we, we try to evaluate that as much as we can. So I, I very much think it will go into 2022 and, and frankly, the recovery into 2023, probably. Josh, do you agree with that? Yeah, I would agree, <clears throat> pardon me. Uh, yeah, I agree with that. Um, I, you know, historically, we've tried to add a lot of value to our tours, which in our minds meant lots of things. Uh, but of course, inherently that makes it a little bit more complex um, and I totally see that happening, that we're, as a result of having learned from this experience, um, that our simpler tours will continue, but the others will come back. I mean, there is a segment of the population that wants to be on the go, go, go all the time and wants to do as much as possible. And then there is obviously a segment that we weren't reaching as effectively as we might have done, which wanted just something simple, just let me get out there for a day or two or three. Um, so yeah, I see it continuing. Um, so with that, I would be remiss if I didn't put on my old DMO hat and ask if you were looking for new product, knowing that it's going to move into 22, 21, 22, possibly 23. Um, have you taken a step back and are you looking to contract new product closer to home or, or in regions that have been popular for you? Like you, you mentioned the national parks. Yeah, it's. Sasha, go ahead, please. I was going to say that um, uh, we, um, because our market is um, very different in that it's local, mm -hmm. um, these are regulars for us. They, they, they come repeatedly. Um, we've, got, we've got passengers, actually more than one, a few of them, who've done over 150 tours with us over the years. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it's a very high repeat rate. We did run a little experiment a few years ago to determine what repeat rate means. And the yardstick that we used was if someone came on their first tour and then came back within 12 months, that to us was a repeat. Mm -hmm. And it was upwards of over 80%, 85%. I mean, it was spectacular. But what that meant is the complaint that we most often get, and nice complaint, is, well, I've already done all your tours. Don't uh, you have anything new? You're constantly looking for new products. Yeah. That's what you're so telling me. Our corporate ethos has always been, we're always developing tours. Now, 
uh, we're small. We typically in a year will do about 200 tours. Historically, it's been about 100 in Canada and 100 to the U.S. But year over year, 40, 50 percent of those tours are brand new to us. So we're constantly looking for new suppliers, new markets, new destinations. Absolutely. It's just an ongoing process for us. That is music to everyone on this call ears. Oh. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and Nadine, what about you? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And I have to go back to um, who we are at, at the core of our business. And we are a company that deals in facts. So we are led by demand. Um, and, and saying that, you know, demand is, is not what it used to be. So we have to do a, a bit more of forecasting right now. And I think we were in a really good position in 2019, fortunately so, to have launched our closer to home uh, North America product. So we did launch in 2019, uh, the United States and Canada in a privately guided customizable way. So it was frankly a, a good time <laughs> because we have good seen a, a shift in uh, demand to Alaska National Park, some of our more uh, nature focused and, and open landscape focused destinations. So in that regard, we are continuously looking at uh, expanding product and destinations specific to North America, where we um, anticipate demand going forward. Awesome. Um, you know, the next question that we're gonna get is, can I get your contact information? So I'll just take that one now and say, we will share contact yes. information so you can reach out to, to both Sasha and Nadine. Um, I did want to just add, uh, make one other observation. Yeah. Sorry, Sherry. No, go um, ahead. But something that Nadine said made me realize it. Uh, one of the questions we occasionally get asked is, do you do surveys? Do you reach out to your customer base to gauge whether there's interest or sentiment? Now, unlike Nadine, your, your tours, which are obviously um, more expensive than the kind of typical fare that we offer, um, we have never, ever done a single poll survey to our client base, ever. The way we work is we're doing a bus tour. We're going to experiment. So a, a DMO will come to us and go, look, have you ever thought about coming to Savannah, for example? We'll go, no, I've never been to Savannah. All right. Maybe we'll go down there. Maybe we won't. Maybe we'll just rely on on the DMO providing us with the right contacts to give us a comfort level. We'll put together a four-day trip to Savannah. and throw it out there and see what the response is like. So our market research is actually done um, by experimenting as opposed to, well, only because the cost factor is substantially lower, right? I mean, if I have to experiment with a tour, a three-day tour, which can ulti ultimately be canceled, um, then we'll cancel it. Having said that, I want you to know we've never canceled a tour due to low uh, signups ever, never happened. No. Well, I was going to say, you have a very loyal base, so I have no doubt in my mind that they would pick up the phone and say, I don't want to go there. What are you talking about? So, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a perfect it's a perfect way to do that. And you just got a shout out for using DMOs and CDBs. Everyone's very happy tip, you know, tipping their hat to you right now. Uh, um, they, they're our prime source of, uh, of uh, information of, about where we should be doing new, new, new tours to. And that's where, for us anyway, all these... Um, now virtual meetings such as the OMCA and the ABA and Heartland and all the other shows we've attended over the years have come in really helpful. So um, you, you mentioned safety for just a minute, you know, where, where you were socially distanced and we, um, just a minute, I, I personally think, I think we all know that those safety measures are going to move forward well into 21 and 22. Um, Will you talk a little bit about maybe some of your, your safe and clean policies and, and what, what you did to, to kind of ensure that, that safety and maintain that consumer sentiment? You want to take the Nadine? Sure, I'll jump in here. Uh, we, at the start of COVID, uh, put together a team who curated our travel uh, safe certified program. Uh, and the standards and expectations of our partners in destination uh, that we work with uh, and who receive clients. So as destinations are opening borders and clients are able to travel, uh, we have a process called our, our readiness program where we evaluate um, the readiness of the destination 
uh, across our, our partners and across the expectations and standards. So it's, it's almost like a training program where we, we ensure our partners are upholding our standards before our clients become um, in destination. So part of those standards include uh, the cleanliness of the vehicles, of the SUVs, of the sedans, uh, includes the mask mandate, um, it includes um, you know, cleanli cleanliness of accommodation, um, and to what degree uh, we engage with our clients in destination um, to support uh, their safety as well and, and cleanliness. So we do have a full list of, of what we offer from a Travel Safe Certified program, which is available on our website if anyone would like to have a, a further look at that. Awesome. And Sasha, you mentioned the social distancing um, and taking temperatures, you know, continuing that in 21 as well. Oh, yeah, I would think so until until customer sentiment comes to a point where that's not that much of a concern. Um, yeah, we, I mean, we you know, the, the, the jury is out on whether taking temperature actually helps, but I think it helps more from the optics than from the actual practical value of taking someone's temperature. Um, and if that creates a sense of, um, of greater comfort for the passengers, then we'll continue to do it. Um, where it caused us a change, um, is a substantial change was um, little things, but that ended up creating complexity behind the scenes of boarding and uh, coming off the bus. I mean, think of it as a small airplane. So our, we have multiple pickup locations on a tour and typically our policy has always been the earlier you book, the closer you sit to the front. Uh, that's a little gratis for booking early. Um, and now we had to change all of that and go through this sort of rather <clears throat> work-laden component of figuring out who was the first to book for their particular pickup location and resorting the seating plan according to that so that when we got to a location, the instructions were, please stay six or eight feet away from the bus door. Don't all crowd, as typically happens when the bus shows up and there's a mass swarm. And uh, our tour director will, will call you by name. And then we board from the back of the bus. Um, that caused a few ruffled feathers because you had people who had special seating needs. Um, maybe they have a particular seat that's their favorite seat that they've always requested. And now we could no longer accommodate that. Um, and um, do this thing where we asked them to remain seated while the bus was in motion. Um, there was a big discussion over, are you allowed to use the washroom while the bus is, while you're on the tour? The, I mean, the washroom on the bus, mm -hmm. the restroom. Uh, and then what are we doing as far as cleaning is concerned for the restroom after it's been used, assuming that, you know, someone on the bus goes inside and uses it because they have to and uh, then touches the door handle and touches the, the safety bar inside the handhold and so on. Um, so we had to implement policies for that. Uh, and of course, uh, work with our bus charter company partners to ensure that they were doing what they should have been doing, um, you know, fogging the buses at night. And um, uh, every time the bus stopped at a particular stop, whatever it might have been, even if it was a lunch stop, the driver would be there with his sanitizing wipes, um, standing at outside at the front of the bus so that every passenger was aware that as soon as everyone was off the bus, the driver was gonna be going through and wiping down all the hard points. So those kinds of things. Sash, so I, I can definitely appreciate uh, where you come from, coming from the group side of business prior to Kensington. It's uh, the level of complexity, I think on, on the bus side is, is very, I would say almost more complex than the private guided because we, again, only have that small travel bubble. So I definitely appreciate uh, what, what the level of complexity and, and safety and standards. You know, if it's even simple things, um, and you're aware of this, if you're on a plane, the plane lands, everybody gets up and is in the aisle. Mm -hmm. Well, now they're all rubbing up against each other, waiting. And of course, they get frustrated when the person in front of them happens to be slow. We've all experienced this. Mm -hmm. Well, how do you rein in that ingrained habit in people to say, you don't get up from your seat until our tour director says you can get up from your seat or the person in front of you in the, from the row in front is at least two rows away. And that took a little bit of indoctrination because we had to get on the microphone and, and I don't wanna say yell at our passengers, but you know, speak in a somewhat semi-form manner to say, uh, uh, Jane, please, please remain seated. L let Joe go past you. 
that kind of thing. So it's part of that. I think we'll continue. It's a mindset change across the board. Um, I knew that we would get a safety question. So as as we're wrapping up this part of the conversation, um, Annie has a great question. and, and, And this has been something that we've all asked each other. Does having a global health and safety certification stamp um, like a GPAC or a WTTC, um, does that make your customers more inclined to want to visit a destination hotel attraction? You know, are you looking for something like that when you're looking for a destination or a hotel or attraction, some type of safety certification that you can market to people? I would say it definitely helps, especially, you know, we're in a very savvy world where clients, even if they are relying on the expertise of their tour planners or destination experts, that they are fact checking and they are reviewing what's included in their itinerary before embarking on that departure. So, uh, you know, if a a hotel or service does have um, a a global certification around safety and and standards, I I think it's it's not a detriment by any means and it, it would help in the process. I'd agree with that. Um, although what we've been doing is not so much relying on whether someone has a, a safety stamp, but with all of our suppliers now, uh, we are asking them to send us directly uh, their protocols. And then we're evaluating them. So in a sense, we're doing the, our own version, if you will, of would we give these people a safety stamp? Does it meet with our criteria? Um, I, in our case, of course, it affects things like when luggage comes off the bus, who's handling the luggage? I mean, it's simple things like that. Who's, who's delivering it to the rooms? What protocols are they, uh, following to deliver them? Are they wearing gloves? Are they wearing masks? Those, those kinds of things, which, you know, you see a safety stamp and maybe that covers that particular supplier from a, you know, a overall perspective, but we're down at the nuts and bolts on the ground trying to ensure that our passengers um, are aware that we've done the due diligence on their behalf. I love that. Um, one of the questions, and, and, and Sash, I think you know, you'll take this one <coughs> because it's specific to motor coach. Um, Lisa was curious as to if the Canadian government had any bailouts that helped the motor coach industry. I, I'm sorry, could you just repeat that, Sherry? You cut out a little bit. <laughs> yes, because I was coughing. I'm so sorry. Um, um, Lisa was curious as to um, if the Canadian government had any bailouts, any it provided any funds to to assist with the motor coach industry during during the heart of, of what's going on right now. I'm not aware of anything specifically directed at the motor coach industry, but the federal government has had its um, uh, em- um, employment uh, um I, I don't even know what's officially called. Nadine, you might remember what it's called. But anyway, it's a plan that compensates all employers for a percentage of their salaries for their employees if they retain their employees. Um, and that's obviously been quite instrumental for everyone in the, I think, in the in the travel business. But I'm not aware of anything specific for um, the motor coach industry. And, and I think it's something that ABA and ONCA have been partnering together on, um, Buses Move America. And I think I... I, I say this all the time. I love what ABA is doing. Um, you can go to their website or Buses Move America and you can find out how you can help and representatives you can talk to to kind of move that conversation forward as we start the conversation now, at least in, in the U.S. with, with a new political regime um, in place. Well, I know that, uh, you know, we're members of the ABA and I know that um, over the last year, we've been getting those emails from uh, Pete Pantuso from from ABA, keeping us up to date. Now, a lot of that doesn't directly apply to us, obviously. Uh, And I know that the um, motor coach sector in the U.S. didn't really get any bailouts under the past administration, but one hopes that perhaps it'll change now. Um, So I have, I'm going to call Robert Graff out real quick because I can, and he's going to laugh when I say that because I know him, so I can call him out. You started a question, my friend, but you didn't finish the question. So go back to Q&A and type in the rest of your question um, as you're thinking about it, and we will get to it, I promise. Um, So I want to switch to marketing. You know, we've talked a lot about the safety and a lot about sales and how your clients are feeling. Um, what What are you doing marketing right now? I mean, I... We all want to know when it's time to actively sell and we don't want to hit you with tons of phone calls if you don't want to get them right now. 
Um, but you know, are you, are you actively selling? I know Sash, you clearly were, you know, in October, you know, last year, um, are you doing that now? Have you moved into that sales side of things for 2021? For us, uh, not at all. Okay. Um, we, we have sent out, I think a grand total of two emails to our, uh, entire, uh, mailing list, thanking them for their support. Um, we do get words of encouragement. We, we get emails from passengers telling us that they can't wait to uh, get going again. But beyond that, no, we, we haven't done anything just because the marketing for us is actually coming up with product that people can book. And of course, the big thing is, well, I don't know when to schedule it for. I mean, do I take a chance and then schedule and cancel and postpone and go through all that effort? So we were just biding our time uh, before we uh, before we start up with our marketing efforts again, once we have a clearer vision of timing more than anything else on yeah. when we can put some product up. Okay. That's, it's Fair a great enough. question around marketing. And you know, again, I think we've been very fortunate to be in a position where we have continued marketing throughout the pandemic and uh, whether it be for clients who are having that shorter booking window of 30 days in or a week in, or if they're being more inspirational and looking towards 2022 for uh, potential travel or even 2023. So we have remained very much engaged with our uh, repeat direct and agent channels, and uh, we do this through weekly newsletters, uh, promoting relevant product um, to, to COVID environment. Uh, we do it for both our direct and our, our um, agents. And then we also have Why I Love webinars weekly in which our destination experts are hosting and explaining you know, what it's like to travel in Namibia, uh, what it could be like now to travel in Namibia. So bringing a bit of the now into it. Um, we also, you know, over the past 12 months have launched a new brochure on our website. So that's available if you'd like to have a look there. And uh, we're actively selling and um, we are engaging with our, our tourism board partners. We have a marketing partnership team in place where uh, we are focusing in on marketing opportunities to promote destinations, either again for immediate travel or, or future travel. So uh, marketing has been a primary focus, I would say for us. Um, again, a little bit different because we have that, that clientele that is able to travel now and doesn't have as much restrictions around the group size. So, Perfect. Um, and thank you for saying that you had that, that marketing opportunity because that was going to be my next question on how people could get involved in that. Um, but I do anticipate a question on um, your um, why I love webinars and trainings and if anyone could get involved in those. Uh, absolutely. I would say, you know, one thing we've learned from the past 10 months is that nothing is off the table. Uh, so, you know, if there is an opportunity or something that sparks in your mind that we could partner on, I, I think we're very much looking at an innovative, fresh set of eyes on, on how we could look at destinations and the promotion of, of certain destinations and locales going forward. So, uh, there's, a, there's a few different ways that we can engage on webinars. Generally, the Why I Loves have historically been led and promoted by our destination experts and marketing team, uh, but we also have the opportunity for internal webinars uh, to further educate our sales team and engage them on any up-and-coming services, as Sash referred to, anything that's new or engaging or, again, uh, suited for the new COVID environment, um, as well as uh, what what's it, what is it like to travel in these destinations now, which I think is really pertinent information for them. Absolutely. Um, so you know, Robert came on strong, you know, he didn't finish a question and now he has three of them in here. Um, that's why we love you, Robert. Um, and um, the question really has to do with what we were talking about with some of the changes and safety pr procedures that, that you've put in place. Um, does that make your price point change? You know, going from 50 people on a bus to 25 people on a bus or, um, you know, and obviously each thing that you add costs money, you know, so has, has that affected your, your price point and how does that affect your consumers? Are they, are they expecting it because they know it's going to cost more or are they expecting you to keep that bottom price? Uh, it impacted our pricing substantially, not so much the the added expenses. We absorbed all of those because really in the grand scheme of things, extra sanitizing wipes and, san, you know, whatever, sanitizing gel is not 
is not by itself a big cost component. Um, but the biggest impact to us was simply the reduction in, in capacity right. uh, because now there are fixed costs for the bus, the driver, the tour guides. Um, there's a big a lot of fixed cost components and those now we have to distribute over 24 instead of 55. So uh, clearly caused uh, a substantial jump. We absorbed a lot of it to try to prevent the cost going up to you know stratospheric heights where no one would come on the tour. Um, we had a just minor pushback. I mean, you know, the 12 tours that we managed to experiment with in September, um, they were all sold out, albeit, as I said, 24 people. So that's a good sign. But uh, contemporaneously with each one of those, we would get the occasional email saying, I'd love to go on this tour, but that's too much for me. Um, so there was a little bit of that price resistance uh, at, the, at, at the higher price points. Not that they were overly substantial, just to give you an idea of perspective, a tour that we might have sold for $100 for the day now went for $140 for the day. So it wasn't like it was a doubling, but there was an increase. We, we haven't seen a massive shift there. I, I will say that, again, our pricing is based off of uh, two clients. So that's generally our between two and three is, is what we see on a booking with the occasional larger travel bubble of, of 10. So when we're looking at changes to pricing, uh, some small group shared experiences where you know, they're better as, as a shared experience, like a culinary, et cetera, uh, mm -hmm. workshop, you know, that's where we have had to privatize them. So there is some slight shifts there, but largely we remain privately guided. So uh, not, not any major changes on our side. Good to know. Um, so we're gonna, we, I feel like I'm bouncing back and forth and I apologize for that, but um, we just had a question come in um, that, that really was, they just want an opinion. Um, is it too early for CVBs to reach out to tour operators for future business? Should I go, Nadine? Please. Uh, uh, no, it's absolutely never too early. We're we're always in contact with the uh, DMOs and CVBs and even suppliers. I mean, we've been getting emails from uh, new hotel properties that opened up and said, "Would you please consider us?" and those kinds of things. Absolutely. We um, we have this database that we maintain of every potential venue, supplier, attraction. DMO, CVB, they all sort of go into this database so that when we're looking at planning tours, we'll go, you know, we've never done a tour to Missouri. Who do we know there? And then we can go to this database and pull everything out, including our contact, past contacts with, as I said, suppliers and DMOs and CVBs. So no, never too, never too early. Right. And well, and you're, and you're planning, you're planning 20, you're 21, yep. you're planning 22, you're moving into what, what 23 looks like. What a, would you agree with that, Nadine? Yeah, to, to build off of what Sash mentioned there, I don't think it's ever a, a bad time to communicate. Yeah. Um, should, should there be an update or a change or, or simply to say hello? We love getting hello messages to make sure you're doing well and you know to have those conversations on, on how we can better partner. So um, I think over the, again, the last year, one of the learnings has been transparent communication and uh, reinforced communication. So more than happy to, to connect. Love that. Um, and at the very beginning of this conversation, um, both of you had a comment. One um, was about added value. And, and Nadine, you commented on, on certain value adds that you require in your tours. Um, so as we're, we're talking about pricing and, and pricing going up a little bit because of these other, these other safety um, procedures that are going in, are you looking for additional value adds that maybe that maybe you weren't looking for in 19, but now are definitely a need in 21? It's a and great question. It's a great question. Um, you know, I, as an organization, we're always looking to add value for our clients, uh, whether that be through engaging with them and finding out that they're a photography fan and delivering a photography book and destination in Alaska, or um, a special amenity when they check in in the Caribbean. So. We're consistently looking for, for value adds um, relative to, to now. Um, nothing comes immediately to mind. Um, again, it, going back to our four pillars of, of what we deliver on on every itinerary, those can be slightly re-envisioned for each collection. So 
if you were to visit our website, you'll see our resort collection is slightly re-envisioned for that. Um, we have an ancestry partnership, for example, that's our four pillars are slightly re-envisioned for a heritage trip. So we're always looking at adding value relative to the demand. Um, and the demand that we've seen so far is around, you know, travel safe certified um, expectations, standards there, um, and, and simply being available and flexible. Flexibility, I think, is a, was a major theme of this past year, and I, I don't see that disappearing anytime soon. Uh, and we remain flexible and available. And what about for you, Sasha? Are you looking for anything in particular? Uh no, I actually I think our approach has been the opposite. I mean, we are. I'm not sure who's on this call. Do we get end user passengers on this call? You do. Well, I okay. will make sure you have it. Yes. I'm sorry. I will make sure that you know who's on this call. Oh no, I just you have meant, hotels uh, and DMOs and attractions and transportation companies and tour providers. You have the gamut throughout. Oh, no, that's uh, fine. But these mostly are... North America. Um, but we have international um, call-ins all the time. Yeah, no, I was just trying to clarify so that I could direct my comments. If there were individual passengers who were not in the travel business on this on this call. Um, all, all B2B. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, our approach to this value add has actually been somewhat the opposite, which is everyone in the industry is impacted. Um, you know, uh, for example, when we are looking at hotel contracts, uh, hotels typically will provide one comp for X number of mm -hmm. rooms. Um, now, because we're operating on such low numbers in terms of our buses, we can no longer hit until our passenger um, capacity goes back up. We can no longer hit some of those uh, room requirements in order to qualify for the comps or the comps at the meals or wherever there's a comp, one for X number, um, because where we might have used 35 rooms for one particular bus tour uh, typically in the past. Um, now we're using 17 rooms. We don't even hit the 20 threshold. So we're getting these contracts and our initial take was to go back to the property and go, look, we appreciate the fact that you're giving us one room for every 25 rooms, but we're never gonna get there. Any flexibility. But then it makes you realize that every one of our suppliers is also coping with the same expenses that we're coping. And we wouldn't be a good partner if we kept insisting that we got something while they were having to shell out something. So we've actually backed off insisting on a lot of the uh, typical ratios. And if a property says, look, I'm really sorry, but expenses are up, we can't give you any comps, we go, we understand, and that's fine. We'll just factor it into the overall price. Um, looking at it more from a partnership standpoint than, uh, hey, what's the best for our bottom line? We don't really care about anybody else. So I would say our value I add has gone that, opposite. I love that you said that because it goes in line with communication and flexibility. And, and um, I think we've all collectively said it's going to take all of us working together to get through this, mm -hmm. uh, which is what I love about our industry. But Nadine, you were going to add something in. I completely agree with Sash. Partnership and, and flexibility have been paramount this past year and going forward. Um, in terms of Kensington's value add, it, it might have a, a dollar figure associated, but largely sometimes it's, it's not a dollar figure, but it's the value add uh, of support and destination or whatever it might be um, that we're, we're trying to commit to. So partners, uh, you know, this past year, we couldn't have done it without you. <laughs> uh, anyone on the call, we couldn't have done it without you. And uh, really looking forward to seeing the pent up demand come back uh, to bring that, our partnerships even stronger. We, we all are. So um, I generally end the call with asking what, um, what we can do for you. You have, you have suppliers that run the gamut on this call. So what, what can they do to help you right now? I can jump in. So jump in. <laughs> Go for it. I was still thinking. Yeah. Yeah, so again, going back to the comment I made around our marketing partnership team, I think, you know, engaging with them uh, to see what next year, the remaining of this year could look like. Um, you know, we, we do look at any possible way to transfer value to the client, whether that be through a promotional offer, pay stays. Um, I know hotels are looking at, um, you know, their inventory and looking at their strategies. And, and if we can better partner on that and promote that, 
um, in direct partnership with you. Um, and again, keeping up with communication anywhere, any changes, uh, the more we communicate, the more we can relate and set the expectations correctly for the clients um, and, and create stronger partnerships and, and relationships with the clients going forward. So um, communication is one paramount uh, that I would say definitely continue with. Uh, and in terms of uh, training, going forward, uh, if there are no services, if you do have presentations, anything concrete that we can fall back on as a training material to share with the sales team, uh, to, to further educate them, uh, and, and any other innovative marketing um, ideas that you might have that you know we might not have experienced or, or put forth yet. We're very open to ideas. Love that. Sash? Uh, I would say, don't be strangers. Um, it, it will eventually come back and uh, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, that's pretty much all I can say and look forward to uh, continuing our relationships and developing, uh, developing new ones and getting the show on the road. Fingers crossed, right? So speaking, you said show. So speaking of getting the show on the road, I'm going to take the opportunity and ask what Connect Travel can do for you. You know, what can, and, and anyone on the call, you know, email me. You guys all have my email. Um, what can Connect Travel as a show provider um, do for, for operators out there? What, what can we do for you? What can we do for the suppliers? How can we help? Stumped That's a good, yeah, you stumped me. I'm trying to think of yeah. <laughs> what, <laughs> uh, what, uh, what Connect Travel can do. I mean, obviously, you've got the connections to um, all these, as we said already, suppliers, DMOs, at least from our perspective and uh, NCVBs and so on. And, um, you know, facilitate more of these. I mean, I, uh, if anything else, I know that you're zoomed out. And what was it? Zoom We're exhaustion, I think, Nadine. Right? But this, I mean, this, Zoom this, fatigue. <laughs> Zoom fatigue. That yeah. was the phrase. I know, Sherry, that you're suffering from uh, Zoom <laughs> fatigue. <laughs> that Nadine, Nadine's words. Uh, I happen to concur. I happen Throwing to concur. Throwing me under the bus, Sasha. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I, I totally uh, concur with that. Uh, but things like this is what lends some energy when you're sitting there in your office going, well, where's the, where's the passenger traffic coming from? And where are my tour operator partners? And, uh, you know, it's this. Um, now, I, I make it a habit of reaching out to some of our partners. I initiate it just to say, so how are you doing in your particular neck of the woods? And, um, and I find those calls actually more helpful for me than I, they may be for the supplier that I'm reaching out to. Um, but I found that very helpful just to create a sense of, some normalcy that these people are still there. The challenge for us has been the huge turnover in, uh, in staffing. You reach out to try one of the suppliers and well, that person's no longer there, unfortunately, because of the furloughing and uh, whatever else. So it's been a lot of re-educating uh, new contacts. Um, we did find, this is just an observation, that our primary contacts are now at much more senior levels, I guess, as the people we typically dealt with have been thinned out a little bit. So um, everyone's you know, definitely working double duty. That's for sure. Yeah. And so where in the past we might have dealt with, you know, the group tour people now, all of a sudden we're dealing with the general manager or someone even higher at some corporate corporate umbrella office somewhere. It's been interesting, but um, yeah, that's all I can say. Connect travel, keep us connected. Isn't that. And we plan mental? to do that. This, uh, I, I love this part of the week because this is, interaction we, we would have seen everyone last year we would have seen everyone four or five times it shows you yeah. know month after month and yeah um, and and calls like this allow us to to stay connected right. kind of teasing because it's the name of the webinar but it does allow us to stay connected um so we will keep doing them as long as as long as there is a need so i appreciate you taking the time to be with us today the conversation was amazing it's already two o'clock i told you it would fly by and i could continue to have this conversation um, but staying in touch and you taking the time to, to make sure all of the suppliers on the call um, know where, what you're doing and how they can participate really means the world. So thank you for taking the time. Everyone, thank you for continuing to tune in. We will be back next Thursday. Um, talk to you soon. Everyone thank have a great gosh. weekend. Thank you, Sherry. Bye-bye. Nice to meet Take you, care. Stay well. Thanks for everyone. Take care. Have a nice day. You too.